G'day, this is Chris Savage from Ariel Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session of the Life of Messiah. I pray that it will be a benefit to you and help you to get to know our Saviour Jesus. Thank you. Welcome to this Life of Messiah. Uh, tonight we're looking at the approval of the King. Uh, last week we looked at his infancy and childhood. Um, last week we saw, last session we saw that Joseph and Mary, they fled to Egypt down there for about one or two years. Uh, meanwhile, Herod kills all the male children two years and old, two years and on there in, in, in Bethlehem. After Herod dies, they head back to Israel, but they head up to Nazareth up in the Galilee, uh, which actually stigmatized Jesus for the rest of his life. And Nazareth was a town of ill repute, and it made Jesus a despised and rejected individual. What do we know about his growth? Well, we know at age five, a young boy would begin to study the Torah, the first five books of the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, and at age 10, he'd then begin to study the oral traditions, which are all the, the um, uh, oral laws, uh, not, the, not the mosaic laws, the ones that they made up themselves. At age 12, he'd be apprenticed either to his father's trade or to another family member. Um, what else we know about Jesus? At, at eight, we, we know that uh, by age 12, he was very switched on. Why? Because we found out from Isaiah, Isaiah 50, verses 4 to 9, that his heavenly father woke him morning by morning to disciple him. So at age 12, Jesus knew exactly who he was, the son of God, and he knew his mission. At age 12, the family head down to Jerusalem for Passover in Jerusalem, and they remain there uh, for, the, for the feast days, head back, but Jesus stays behind. They didn't know that at the time, but he remains there, and he is debating with the doctors of the law at age 12 in the temple, and they are absolutely amazed at his knowledge, especially since he was from Nazareth, which was, uh, you know, not a... Not a um, um, not a spiritually aware town, if you like. They were, uh, if you want to get rich, you go north up, up north to Galilee. If you want to be spiritual, you go south down to Jerusalem. But he was from up north. Now, when, when they come back and they find him, uh, you know, he, he makes very plain to his mother, Mary, that he is about his heavenly father's business. Remember, he, age 12. Age 12, a boy's apprentice to his, his dad. But here Jesus is saying, look, I'm about my heavenly father's business also. Um, and, and he said, you know, you know, you should have known where to look for me. I'm in my father's house, which is a temple. Luke gives us a, a, one, a one verse summary of his life. He said that he grew up just like any other young, young boy. Um, now, we meet John the baptizer. He's the forerunner. He's the herald of the Messiah. He's preaching a back to God movement for the kingdom of God is near. He started around six months before Jesus starts his public ministry. Now, also, uh, the Sanhedrin, we, we know that there is a, a, a two-stage investigation. We, we'll see that today, but uh, what we see last week is that uh, in, in this investigation, we have two stages, the, uh, the observation and then the interrogation stage. Uh, we have the observation stage with John last week. Um, they can only observe what's going on. They can't say anything. They can only observe what's going on. You need to check it out to see whether it's a significant movement. Second stage, investigation. They ask questions, raise objections, look for a basis to accept or reject the movement. Now, what did the Sanhedrin members see? They saw all walks of life coming to John John's back to God movement, his repentance movement, uh, and John is telling the people to prepare for the coming king and the kingdom by doing things which were uh, um, contrary to their office. For instance, you know, he, he spoke to tax collectors he, and soldiers. He says, listen, stop extorting the people. Stop stealing from the people. Uh, stop your ex extortion. And for the ordinary ma men, he said, listen, stop hoarding what you have instead share with those who have need. So that's, that's pretty much where we're up to today. Now, 
Today, this here is what we spoke briefly about, the investigation by the Sanhedrin. Now, John is proclaiming the coming of a king and a kingdom, and his preaching had obvious messianic overtones, and so he has to be investigated. Now, according to Matthew chapter 3, verses 5 to 7, it caused quite a stir. Uh, it was drawing the attention, what John was doing was drawing the attention of even the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Uh, remember the Pharisees, Sadducees, we spoke about them last week. The first, now, the first stage of the investigation is observation. And at this stage, a delegation was sent out only to observe and nothing else. At this point, they're to observe what was being said, what was being taught and done. And at this point, they could raise no questions or make any objections. They could not verbalize anything. They were simply to watch, observe. All they could do was observe. Now, after the period of observation, they would then return to Jerusalem and give a report and issue a verdict. Is it significant? Is it a significant movement or isn't it? Um, and so if they said the matter was insignificant, they drop it. If it was significant, uh, uh, then the second stage would be started. And the second stage was interrogation. Now, what does that mean? It means that they'd send another delegation out, but this time uh, they would go out for the purpose of asking questions, raising objections. They were looking for a basis to either accept or reject uh, this person's claims. What's John proclaiming? John is proclaiming the coming of a king and a kingdom, and that has very obvious messianic overtones. So in paragraph 22, we have the first stage with, with the obligation to only listen to what was said, taught, or done. And Matthew 3, verse 7 says, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, they came not to be baptized, but simply to observe. There was no repentance there, as his word clearly shows us. Luke verse 7 says, the multitude that went out to be baptized of him, but the Pharisees and Sadducees merely came to the baptism. In Matthew 3 verse 7, he says, <laughs> John says to, to these guys, he says, you offspring of vipers. Who wants you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruit worthy of repentance. Remember, um, John's baptism was the baptism of repentance. He says, hey, there, there's no repentance from you guys. So, you know, there was no repentance on the part of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Um, this was a prerequisite for being baptized by John. When it speaks about the wrath to come, well, what, what, what are we talking about? It's actually a very common uh, teaching uh, it's a term, it's a common teaching term for the day of Jehovah, also called the day of the Lord uh, in the Hebrew Bible. Um, now, this, this phrase is always in a reference to the period of the outpouring of divine judgment just preceding the establishment of the Messianic kingdom. We know it uh, as the Great Tribulation. Now, he warns them. He warns the, the Pharisees and Sadducees, the, 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 you know, the observation team, not to go around saying we have Abraham as our father. What's, 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 what's that, all that about? Well, we'll deal with this more in paragraph 33. But for now, uh, in Pharisaic theology, in the, in the Pharisaic theology of the day, there is a concept referred to as zekhut avot, which means the merits of the fathers. So what they taught was that uh, any descendant of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, was protected from divine punishment simply on the merits of the fathers. That's what they taught. So it doesn't matter what you did, so long as you were, you were one of the descendants, as long as you're a Jew, you're okay. Now, what they observed here is that John is teaching the people to do things which are contrary to their nature and to their office of nature. I think I mucked up with my introduction. It says, he that has two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. And he that hath food, let him do likewise. Now, it's in the nature of people to hoard their wealth, not to simply uh, take what they need and, and give the rest away. They, they you know, they... We're hoarders. 
In Luke verse, uh, Luke chapter 3, verse 12, the publicans came and he told them to only collect taxes that are appointed to them and no more. Now, the reason the people became publicans or tax collectors uh, was not because it paid very well, but because of what Rome allowed them to get away with. And uh, the government, the Roman government, for instance, decided that, you know, uh, Mr. Cohen, um, he, he owed Rome five shekels in taxes. But the publicans, the tax collectors, would tell Mr. Cohen that he owed 10 shekels to Rome. He would give the five to Rome and he'd keep the other five for himself. So the publicans or the tax collectors became very wealthy from extorting from their own people. Now, John says, he says, extort no more than that which is appointed you. And this was contrary to why they even took the office. One had to pay taxes every time they entered a new region or, or a territory. Uh, also, Rome didn't prevent the abuse of power uh, that these tax collectors had. So they became very wealthy people. Very wealthy indeed. Now, in Luke chapter 3, verse 14, soldiers come to him and they said, and we, what must, what must we do? Now, in this context, uh, these are Jewish soldiers they were coming to him. Uh, these guys would have been mercenaries in the Roman army. And now, again, why would they bother? Well, because of what Rome allowed them to get away with. Uh, remember, if they were given the authority to occupy the country or the people, then they could do as they wished to the people. They, they could do whatever was forbidden under the Mosaic law. They could do that to the people. So they could exact things from the, from the occupied people and they could commit acts of violence against them, forcing uh, the victims to do things they didn't want to do. So these Jewish soldiers would actually supplement their income in this way. Now, John's answer to them is, do violence to no man, neither exact anything wrongfully and be content with your wages. In other words, he is he, admonishing them to do the exact opposite of what had driven them to become mercenaries in the first place. Now, at this point, what the delegation of Pharisees and Sadducees had observed was that John was telling the people to prepare for the coming of the king and the kingdom by doing those things which are contrary to either their nature or their office. And later on, when this delegation returned to Jerusalem, they declared the movement of John the baptizer was very significant. We're going to see what happens to the herald will happen to the king. And this, we're going to see this right throughout. The herald of John the Baptist, the king is Jesus. Now, we have the promise by John. This is John the Baptist, not John the Apostle. Uh, and we see this in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11 to 12, Mark 1, 7 to 8, and Luke 3, 15 to 18. In Matthew verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 11, John points out the distinction between himself and the Messiah who will follow him. John says he's not even worthy to carry his sandals, which was the most humiliating of tasks for a slave. In other words, uh, John is saying he considered himself not worthy to be that close to the Messiah. His Messiah is up there and I'm down here. In verses 11 to 12, John also speaks of two baptisms and then he defines the second one. Now, John's baptism was with water. It was a baptism, a baptism of repentance. But Messiah's baptism, Jesus' baptism, is one with the Holy Spirit and fire. So we see fire with Jesus, fire and the chaff, and then we see the unquenchable fire to the lake of fire. We see the Holy Spirit, wheat, barn, kingdom, and that's what we'll see. Uh, John says here, he says, listen, he says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So Messiah's baptism will be different. It will be by the Holy Spirit and by fire. It, it says uh, John, uh, John uh, 
Matthew goes on to say, he says, listen, he says, whose fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly cleanse his threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into the garner, but the chaff he will burn up with unquenchable fire. Now, what's this all mean? The wheat in Matthew's context is the believer. The ones who embrace Jesus and the chaff is the unbeliever, the ones who reject Jesus. So those who will be baptized by the Holy Spirit are identified as the wheat believers. Wheat is going to be gathered into the garner or, or the barn, uh, which in Matthew, uh, John the Baptist context, is the messianic kingdom. So these will enter the kingdom. But those baptized by fire are the chaff which are the unbelievers, what happens to the chaff is that that chaff it will, will be burned up with unquenchable fire. Uh, the, the unquenchable fire here is the lake of fire that we see in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15. So John the Baptist will baptize by water to repentance. Messiah will baptize by the Holy Spirit and with fire on two groups of people. Believers, the wheat, unbelievers, the chaff. Notice here that there is no middle group. You're either one or the other. There is no middle ground. There is no purgatory. Everyone will be baptized by one or the other. This is why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, that by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. Every believer is baptized in the spirit into the body of Christ, the church. Those who reject the message are destined to have the other baptism, the baptism of unquenchable fire. In this immediate context, the fire is, is a judgment and it's not a blessing. Uh, so the fire here is not the tongues of fire parting asunder like is it? that's not the, the fire of Acts chapter 2. But this is the lake of fire. And in Luke uh, verse 18, he says, with many other exhortations, therefore preached he good tidings unto the people. So at this point here, uh, John has undergone the first stage of observation by the Sanhedrin. At this point, we're going to begin to see a motif that will follow right throughout the course between John and Jesus. The motif here is that whatever happens to the herald, John will happen to the King Jesus. Now, the approval of the king. We see this at his baptism. And this is in Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 to 17, Mark 1, 9 to 11, and Luke 3, 21 to 23. Now, the king is going to be approved in three ways. First, at his baptism. Now, the baptism here marks the last act of his private life and the first act of his public life. We need to look at the, 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 the word baptism here, key words. Um, it's a Jewish ritual, right? Uh, a baptism was a Jewish practice long before it was a church practice. Baptism, uh, self-immersion in, in what's called a mikvah as a ritual did not begin with John and Jesus. Um, you see the Hebrew word there is tevila, which is, a, which is Hebrew for ritual immersions. Often we see it as washings. Um, it, it had to do mainly with ritual cleansing from ritual uncleanness. Now, this was the basic meaning of the word. Now, when baptism was applied to a Gentile convert to Judaism, it took on the meaning of identification. Right. So as far as the Greek meaning, you have the initial uh, root of the word, which is bapto, uh, which means to dip or to die. Now, it was used of taking a piece of cloth and dipping it into dye. And in so doing, what would happen is you change this color and therefore you change its identity. So the basic meaning of the act is to identify. Baptism means to identify. It's to identify with a person or a message or a, or a group or movement. So from, from bapto, we had this more intense word called baptizo, uh, and uh, this means it's a regular word for immersing. Um, it's, it's the equivalent to tevila. Uh, now, uh, it was a very common term. What, what you do, for instance, you had your dinner, 
you would then uh, baptize her, your, your dish into the water, right? So you'd immerse it into the water to clean it. So we have what we have here, it, it, these, these two words carry two concepts here. Um, first, it, it, uh, it means to immerse and uh, it can be ritualistic. It doesn't have to be there. So it's, the mode is immersion. Second basic meaning is to identify with. Uh, our English word baptism comes from this word baptizo. It's, it's not a natural English word, actually. It's, it's a Greek word. It's just that what happens was when the Bible was translated into English, the, the majority of, of, the, of the church had been practicing sprinkling or, or some were practicing pouring. But they weren't practicing immersion. Um, so it's a bit of an embarrassment to translate the Greek word literally as immersion. So to avoid having to change a church's way of performing the ordinance, the translators simply chose to transliterate rather than translate the word. And so the word baptism is what came about. But the Greek word means immersion, right? Um, so we need to, again, keep in mind here that, that this baptism, even as a ritual, it began with the Jewish people and that immersion was the only way of baptizing. And to this day, it is the only way of baptism, baptism by immersion. Jews do not know of any other form of baptism. They do not accept sprinkling or pouring. So the meaning of the word is immersion. The meaning of the act is identification. So baptism meant that uh, one was identifying with a new group, but also that they were breaking away from the old group. So when a Gentile converted to Judaism, it meant that he was breaking away from his old identification and he was now re-identifying with Judaism. And those who were being baptized by John, this is the disciples of John, were committing themselves to accept the one that John would point out as the Messiah. They were identifying with themselves with that message from John. And we're going to see later on that those who were baptized by John did actually uh, uh, accept Jesus as Messiah. Now, listen, John's baptism is not the same as believers' baptism. All right. That's, that's why uh, those who were baptized earlier on by John, but who had left the country and then they bumped into Paul in, then in Acts chapter 19, they were rebaptized into believers' baptism. Believer's baptism means that one is now identifying oneself with the death, a burial, and resurrection of Jesus, which we see from Romans chapter 6, verses 3 to 4. Yeah, we also, if you look in, in 1 Corinthians 1, you see that you see that the Corinthians were you know, falsely identifying themselves with those who baptized them rather than with the person of Christ. Okay. So what we see here is mikvah and, uh, uh, and uh, bapto are place of immersion, uh, whereas tevila and baptiza it, it was the actual immersion itself. Okay. Having covered baptism, six reasons for the baptism of Jesus. Um, he, uh, Jesus comes to John to be baptized in verse 14, and he's, John would have hindered him. Why hinder him? Well, you know, because Jesus had no need to be baptized for repentance. He had nothing to repent of. He also had no need to come back to God because he's God. Uh, but Jesus insists on being baptized. You know, every major event in Jesus's life, his birth, his baptism, transfiguration, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, every one of those carries theological implications for us. So we need to look at the reasons why Jesus now insists on being baptized. Now, in Matthew 3, verse 15, it says there to fulfill all righteousness. Now, what's right? Righteousness simply means to live a life consistently with a standard or to conform perfectly with a standard. And the standard at this, at this point was Mosaic law. So he was being baptized to show that he identified himself with the righteousness of the Mosaic law and showing that he would fulfill all of its righteous demands. 
So this will identify Jesus with righteousness. The second reason he was being baptized was to be identified with the preaching of the kingdom. That's John's message. He is preaching that the kingdom of God has come. Third reason to be baptized is to be identified with the believing remnant being prepared by John. Now, those believing John and being baptized are making up the believing remnant of Israel of that day and are being prepared by John. Now, what's the remnant? Well, it's that small portion of Israel that believes compared to the larger portion that does not believe. And right throughout the Old Testament, there are always a large number of Israelites that did not follow the scriptures and a small group that did believe the scriptures. Uh, the majority were idolaters and they followed the occult practices of their neighbors. Uh, cast your mind back to Elijah's day, for instance. In Elijah's day, he thought he was the only one left, but God says, no, he says, I've got 7,000. 7,000 amongst you know, over a million uh, Israelites uh, who did not follow after other gods. Only 7,000. That was the remnant. You can see that in 1 Kings 19, uh, verse 14. Now, here at the beginning of John's ministry, uh, the remnant is comprised of those who believe John's message and who were being prepared to accept Jesus as the Messiah. The fourth reason... The fourth reason he is being uh, uh, baptized was to be publicly made known to Israel. A public, verbal, and visible authentication of his messiahship shortly. Second Corinthians 5.21, uh, the fifth reason here is to be identified with sinners because he's, he's in the likeness of sinful flesh. So Jesus took upon himself the likeness of sinful flesh to, so that he could be identified with sinners. In Acts chapter 10, verse 38, we see the sixth reason is to receive his special anointing by the Holy Spirit. It says, Jesus of, this is Acts 10, 38, says, Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Okay. At the baptism of Jesus, you have the appearance of all three members of the triune God, either visibly or audibly. In Matthew 3, verse 16, we have God the Son in the person of Jesus. He went up straight away from the water, coming up out, so he's coming up out of the water, which means he had to go under the water, means he is immersed. Um, he comes up out of the water. So we have Jesus. In verse 16 of Matthew 3, we also have God the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove. Uh, in Luke, uh, verse 22, the Holy Spirit descended in a bodily form, not a ghost. He came in invisible form. Now, of all the ways that the Holy Spirit could, could have come, why did he choose a dove? This is to communicate to a Jewish audience. So there must be a Jewish reason, and there is. The first time the Holy Spirit is mentioned in the scriptures is in Genesis 1, chapter 1, verse 2. It says the Spirit of God moved or brooded upon the face of the waters. Now, the word brooded is America fit. It's used of a mother bird hovering over her eggs just before they hatch. So the wording of Genesis 1, verse 2 relates this appearance of the Holy Spirit to the actions of a mother bird, and he was brooding over the waters like a mother bird did just before the hatching of dry land. That's the Holy Spirit. But the ancient rabbinic commentaries, the Midrashim, uh, which is a collection of rabbinic writings, it compares the Holy Spirit in Genesis 1-2 as like a dove. So Rabbi specified the bird to be a dove so that what we have here is that the mindset was already there. The Holy Spirit was connected with the concept of a dove. So now we see the sun and the spirit were now visible. And then in verse three, we have the verse, 
sort of the third thing in verse 17, the father audibly appears with his voice out of heaven. And this also has a, a rabbinic Jewish background because uh, we see in Jewish writings, you will read about a bat kol, B-A-T-K-O-L. This in Hebrew literally means the daughter of a voice. In rabbinic theology, the voice of the prophets ceased with Malachi. It was the last of the prophets. However, while the prophetic voice ended, the voice of God did not. And periodically, God spoke a short sentence out of heaven. This was the bat call. The Shekinah glory is visible, but the bat call is audible. So, so again, this, in keeping with the Jewish mindset of the day, the father says out of heaven, the bat call, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So here, the voice from heaven identifies Jesus as his son. And this is mentioned in Psalm 2, verses 7 to 12. It says, kiss the son, lest he be angry. Now, God the father will speak out of heaven three different times during Jesus's public life public ministry and this is the first time now what two things happened at his baptism first of all jesus was verbally identified by god the father secondly he was anointed by the holy spirit for service now in luke uh, 22 we see that jesus began to teach at about the age of 30 it doesn't say he was exactly 30 it just says he was only about 30 now, as his baptism occurred around AD 27, and based upon the fact that he was born somewhere between 7 and 6 BC, Jesus was actually around about 33 or 34 at this time. Now, the temptation. He's just been baptized. Now we have the temptation. And the temptation here we see in Luke chapter 4, 1 to 13, Matthew 4, 1 to 11, and Mark 1, 12 to 13. And this is going to be his second approval as king, his temptation. And we shouldn't miss the correlation here because uh, between uh, paragraph 24 and 25, because in paragraph 24, which we just did, he was declared to be the son of God. In, now, in, 20, in the temptation, he's going to be asked to prove it. In 24, he is baptized to fulfill all righteousness. In paragraph 25, that righteousness is going to be tested and he'll be found to be righteous. Now, all three Gospels make it clear that the temptation was part of the divine plan of God. Because in, math, in Mark 1.12, it says, straight away, after his baptism, the spirit driveth him. Matthew 4.1 says, Jesus was led of the spirit into the wilderness. Luke 4.1, full of the Holy Spirit, he was led by the Holy Spirit. So this, all three Three of the gospel writers say that it was a spirit taking you into the wilderness. Mark in his account only says that he was tempted in the wilderness by, by, by Satan for 40 days. And he was with the wild beasts. That's all, that's all the detail Mark gives us. Matthew and Luke give the actual temptation, the temptation accounts. So now, if you read the temptation accounts in Matthew and Luke, you will find that the accounts are different. So if we want to know which account or which order is correct, we need to go to Luke's gospel. Remember, Luke is the only gospel writer who claimed to write things in chronological order. Matthew put his order in accordance with his theme. Remember, Matthew's theme is the kingship of Jesus or, or the kingdom of Jesus. So the key temptation for Matthew regards the kingdom. The last and most powerful temptation relating to his throne. For Satan was offering him this. He was offering the kingdom of the world. Now, Luke, on the other hand, gives us the actual order in which they occurred. That's why we'll see in this study we follow Luke's order because he's the only gospel writer who puts it in order. Now, what's the purpose of the temptation? Uh, God, we see it from two perspectives here. God's aim in the temptation is to show the sinlessness of the son. But Satan's aim is to cause him to sin, to cause him to sin using the method which he often uses by offering Jesus a shortcut 
to keep him from the cross. Remember, it's if he can thwart his messianic goal, no atonement. He simply tried to accomplish the impossible. Why? Because Messiah Jesus is impeccable, which means he's simply not able to sin. However, that did not discourage Satan from attempting the impossible. If Jesus had given into this temptation, it would have been a good example of the attainment of a, a legitimate end by illegitimate means. If he'd given into the temptation of, of, of worshiping Satan and got the kingdoms of the world, that's a legitimate end, but he went the wrong way about it. But he didn't do that. Now, in the temptation, Jesus plays a representative role, but he plays two representative roles. First, he plays a role with Israel, and secondly, he is representative of all men. First, you don't normally hear about, but the second is usually taught. With Israel, this one ideal Israelite has not failed. Where Israel as a nation failed to keep the Mosaic Covenant, this one will not fail. Second, with all believers, he shows us how we are to deal with temptation. Now, what's the role with Israel? Uh, we see it in five ways here. First of all, in, in both cases, the term son of God is used. Israel, national Israel, is the son of God according to Exodus chapter 4, 22 to 23. Here, Jesus is constantly referred to as the son of God more than the son of man. Satan called him this in Matthew 4, uh, verse 3, verse 6. Uh, and we see it also in Luke chapter 4, verse 3 and 9. Satan taunts Jesus, if you are the son of God. Uh, remember, uh, last session we talked about how, um, uh, how Matthew 2.15 uh, stated that Jesus, you know, he lived in Egypt in fulfillment of the scripture. Out of Egypt did I call my son, Isaiah 11.1. 1. Well, that's what we did last week. Remember, it was a literal plus typical way to quote Old Testament scriptures. Jesus is a type. He's a type of Israel in this verse. Now, same as he's in the testing in the wilderness. The second way he's tested is that both testings, Israel and Jesus, took place in the wilderness. According to 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 13, Israel, Israel, Israel's experience in the wilderness was a time of testing. Now Jesus is, is in the wilderness experiencing a time of testing. We see this in Luke 4, 1 to 2. Third area is that we see the number 40. Israel was, was in the wilderness for 40 years. Jesus, uh, we see that in Numbers 23, 13. Now, Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days. So the number is number 40 is prominent in both cases. The fourth way we see that the, the role is in the presence of the Holy Spirit. According to Isaiah chapter 63, three times it's said between verses 7 and 14 that the Holy Spirit was present with Israel in the wilderness. Now, the first verse of all three gospel accounts shows the presence of the Holy Spirit with Jesus. The Spirit dro drives him. He was led of the Spirit. He's led of the Spirit. Now, the fifth uh, representative role is that we see that when Jesus quotes scripture, which he does three times, all of his quotes come from one book of the Bible, Deuteronomy. It comes from Deuteronomy 8, 3, 6, 16, and 6, 13. Yeah. The book of Deuteronomy is God's covenantal book with Israel. You know, what most people observe is that when you read through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, is that Deuteronomy is repeating either the history or the laws of the previous books. And so, you know, in Greek, the book was given the name Deuteronomy because it was, it's the second giving of the law or, or a repetition of the law. However, that's not really what it is. You missed the point here why Moses repeats the law in Deuteronomy. Now, what Moses is doing in Deuteronomy is to take both the history and many of the laws from the previous three books 
And what he does is he rearranges them into an ancient covenantal format. It's called a suzerain vassal treaty. And it has five or six points. It was a legal document. It was a binding contract. And uh, many of those treaties have been discovered in archaeological findings. So these are treaties between a ruler and his vassals, his subjects. So the book of Deuteronomy is God's uh, covenantal arrangement with Israel. And uh, since Jesus is the representative of Israel in this temptation, in all three of his quotations come from this book of Deuteronomy. Why? Because he's fulfilling the covenant. So in these five ways, he plays the representative role of Israel, showing where Israel failed, this one Israelite did not fail. So the point here is that where Israel as a nation failed to keep God's covenants, uh, Jesus did not fail. He became Israel's substitute, uh, not only in these temptations, but also as the final substitute, the final sacrifice for sin. Now, what about with the believers? Second role here is that uh, it, we see he's representing believers. In Hebrews 4, in Hebrews 4 verse 15, it says there, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Now, when the book of Hebrews says he was tempted in all points as we are, it does not mean that Jesus suffered every type of temptation that believers do, any more that believers suffer every type of temptation that he did. For example, none of us have ever been tempted to change stones into bread. We never will be tempted because Satan is not going to waste his time because he knows we can't do it, right? For us, it's not a real temptation, but for Jesus, it was because he could turn stones into bread. He did have the power. On the other hand, having never married, Jesus was never ever tempted to commit adultery. Never married. Never tempted to do that. But if you're married, you are. We are. So again, Hebrews 4.15 doesn't mean that he suffered every type of temptation that we do any more than we suffer every type of temptation that he did. It put, what it pointed points out here, the basic meaning uh, of these basic these temptations, the basic areas of temptation we see in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. It tells us that there are three areas of temptations. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Every specific type of temptation falls into one of these three categories. And Jesus suffered temptations in the same three areas that we do. So he was tempted in all points as we are yet without sin. Now, first temptation, changing stones into bread, came at the end of a 40-day fast. He was very hungry. It was the will of God for him to be satisfied with food at this point, but it was not the will of God to use his messianic power or uh, for the purpose of self-gratification. So the first temptation was in the area of the lust of the flesh. Make bread from stones. The second temptation in, the, in Luke 4, verse 5 to 8, Jesus was given a satanic vision. And in this satanic vision, Jesus was literally shown all the kingdoms of the world. In verse 5, it says, in a moment of time, Satan said, I will give you my authority. Is it a legitimate saying? Yes, it was, because he is the prince, as the prince of this world, he has authority over the kingdoms of this world. And he can offer it to whoever he wishes. Just worship me once, he says, and I will give it all to you. Again, what we see here is that this was a shortcut to the messianic goal. Because it is the will of God, uh, God the Father, for Jesus the Son to rule over the kingdom of this world. But the means of obtaining that authority is by means of the cross, not by means of worshiping Satan. So Jesus could see what could be his for one act of worship. This was a temptation in the area of the lust of the eyes. Third temptation is in Luke 4, 9 to 12. He was taken to the pinnacle of the temple. This is the, 
the, the, the southeast corner above the city wall and temple compound. It's about 216 foot high back in that day. And Satan says, listen, if you are the son of God, just cast yourself down from here. Prove it to me by jumping off the pinnacle of the temple. Why? Because Psalm 91 uh, verses 11 to 12 says there that angels would have rushed to his rescue because he was not allowed to die before his time. So the angels would have let him down gently to the ground. The temple compound was always full of people and they would have seen Jesus jump off and then just let down slowly to the ground. Man, he would have floated to the ground and that would have proved, they would have proclaimed him to be the Messiah. But this is not the way that God wanted to prove his messiahship. And he had nothing to prove to Satan anyway. So Satan says, if you really are, prove it by fulfilling scripture. And let me see Psalm 91 fulfilled. This is a temptation in the area of the pride of life. Prove you are whom you claim to be. So Jesus truly did suffer temptation in the same areas that we do. And this temptation of the pinnacle was a, was a temptation, uh, or, or was a test of his dependency upon God. There's a right way and a wrong way of depending upon God. The wrong way tests God, tempting him to fulfill his promises. So we see here stones into bread. That was a challenge related to the will of God. It was God's will to satisfy his hunger. It was God's will for him to do it in his God's way, right? Not using his miraculous power. Kingdoms of the world was a test of his submission. Would Jesus consistently submit himself to God the Father, or would he, on this one occasion, give in to Satan? Temptation, the pinnacle of the temple was a test of his dependence upon God. Uh, there's a right way and a wrong way of depending upon God. The wrong way tests God, tempting him to fulfill his promise. If Jesus had jumped off the pinnacle, uh, defined the will of the Father, he would have been testing God's promises. One must never test God's promises. One must simply believe that he will fulfill them in his due time. When it was God's will for Jesus to be proven the son of God, this was not the, not the, it was not the means of doing it this way. Now, when Jesus resists Satan, how did he do it? Well, he doesn't get around calling Satan names. He doesn't get around binding him or casting him out. He doesn't do any of those things. He simply quotes scripture relevant to the issue. This is exactly the way we must fight spiritual warfare by application of scripture to that specific issue. In Luke's account, verse 13, uh, what we see there is that when Satan has completed his temptation, which is in all these three areas, he departed from him. Notice here that the scriptures teach us that if we resist Satan with scripture, he will flee from us. And we see that in James chapter 4, verse 7, and, and also Ephesians 6, 10 to 18. Now, Satan will flee, but only for a season. There'll be more spiritual battles later on. So, you know, and, and you know, this battle will be continually fought till we actually die. Now, we see here the testimony of John before the leaders. First approval of the king was at his baptism. His second was through his temptation. Third area will be, uh, of his, his approval will be by the herald himself, before the leaders and before Jesus. Now we have the second stage of interrogation. Paragraph 26, we have the testimony of John before the leaders of the Sanhedrin. What we have here is the second stage of investigation and this is the stage of interrogation. Remember, this time, they're to ask questions. They don't have to be silent anymore. They're now to ask questions. And three times in this passage, we're told that this is an official delegation from Jerusalem. In John chapter 1, verse 19, verse 22, and verse 25. John 1, 19 says, and this is the witness of John, John the Baptist, when the Jews sent unto him from Jerusalem priests and Levites to ask him, who are you? So these were officials sent from the Sanhedrin, uh, and these were generally Sadducees. John, John chapter 1, verse 22. 
who art there that we might give an answer to them that sent us. So we have here, it's a sent delegation. Chapter 1, verse 25, it says, sent from the Pharisees. So the full Sanhedrin was involved in this questioning of John. Now, John denies being three things. In verse 21 of John chapter 1, he denies being the Messiah. He says, he says, I'm not the Messiah. In verse 21, he also denies being Elijah. He says, I'm not Elijah. Even though he did come in the spirit and power of Elijah. But he says, no, I'm not Elijah. Third area, verse 21 again, he denies being the prophet. Now, this is, this is the prophet that Moses prophesied about. And this is the prophet that the woman at the well says to Jesus, are you the prophet? This is found in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 to 18. And uh, John says, no, he said, I'm not the prophet. John denies being any of these three people. So the next question is, well, if you're not any of those, well, who are you then? John now answers by quoting Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. He says, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. He's claiming here to be the Messiah's forerunner. He claims to be the herald of the king. But he pointed out in verse 26 that I baptize with water, but in the midst of you standeth one whom you know not even he that cometh after me, the latchet of whose shoe I'm not worthy to unloose. So what John is saying here is, he's saying that the Messiah was present, but was not yet identified by John. So John has undergone the second Sanhedrin stage, the stage of interrogation. And again, what happens to the herald will happen to the king. And that... That is it for tonight. That's our contact details there if you need to contact us, contact us for any reason.